Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're just going to give it another minute so that we let people join. Okay, we will now begin. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Atlas Mission Accomplished webinar. We're delighted to be joined by Dr. Zoe Randall today, co-author of the book and senior surveys officer at Butterfly Conservation. Just before I pass you over, I need to do the usual bit of housekeeping. Please note we are recording today's presentation and we will hope to share this recording with you live afterwards. And we are also live on Facebook today. Uh, please remember that everyone except the speaker will be muted throughout. However, if you need help at any point, you can type into the chat box in the control panel at the bottom of the screen and where possible, we will help. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. And if you have any, you can submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get through as many questions as possible in the allocated time. Okay, and I will now pass over to Dr. Randall. Hi, good evening. Thanks ever so much to Becky for uh, the introduction there and the housekeeping. So, well, it's been um, about a year, I think, a year today since I got my hands on the uh, copy of the Atlas of Britain and Ireland's Larger Moths. And here it is in its full glory. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to tell you how we, how we got to uh, produce this landmark publication. So, um, excuse me, out the way, come on. So, so... A lot of endurance was required to uh, get the Moth Atlas done. And despite feeling stuck in pack ice at times, we were really fortunate that we didn't get crushed under the pressure of it all, unlike Shackleton's ship of the same name. I also discovered that Atlas was the god of endurance uh, during the, the Moth Atlas process. And uh, there he is with the weight of the world on his shoulders. And, and I can tell you now, that's exactly how we all felt during the, the four years that we were, were putting the uh, Atlas together. And as with all epic journeys, there are highs and lows, there are losses and gains, and there are many interesting characters that you meet along the way. And I think we can all safely say that our lives are in the Moth Atlas. Every person that worked on it, every person that contributed a dot or a record, to their county moth recorder that's in the atlas, our lives are in this in this book. I drew up lots of timelines, like all good project managers do. Um, we had timelines drawn up, and uh, this is all great, but unfortunately, uh, none of them none of them worked. We all we, they all slipped, and uh, in the end, I decided that the best thing to do was to go with the flow. Things will happen when they happen, bits will fall into place, a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. And according to Einstein, the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. And we finally got there. And how did we get there? Well, basically there was 11 scientists working on the project on and off over a period of five years. And the whole County Moth Recorder network were involved and hats off to all of them and the sterling work that, that they do. Um, we had to start somewhere. The first place we decided to start was to source images for the Atlas. And all the images needed to be really, really high quality. The moth had to be in good condition, had to, be, had to look like the normal sort of form and not have any weird, weird ones in there. And, um, <clears throat> and also they had to be sort of sat on an appropriate background. Some images were harder to source than others. For example, the Ascent Gem, there's only two British records for this moth. And so we went to um, overseas, um, overseas colleagues um, to source these. For example, this one by Wolfgang, Wolfgang Wagner. Then there's the Minsmere Crimson Underring wing. There's only one British record for this. So you can imagine trying to get a, an image for that for, from the UK was pretty tricky. Um, and again, Wolfgang delivered this absolutely stunning image for us. Unexpectedly, there were some 
common and widespread moths that were a bit tricky to get images for. For example, the heart and dart, which earlier on this year was just numerous in, in the moth traps. And it was, you know, it's, you, you could just have a moth trap absolutely rammed full of hearts and darts. And for whatever reason, it took us quite a while to source a decent picture of this, this particular species. And maybe it's because it's what you could consider to be a mother's moth. It's brown, it's not that interesting to look at, and perhaps people didn't think it was worthy of a photo shoot. But we got there in the end, thanks to um, Mark Parsons, our former colleague. The Scarlet Tiger, now that was another interesting one. It's a really beautiful moth, um, worthy of being on the front cover of Vogue and can give any butterfly a run for its money in the beauty stakes. And, uh, and again, this is quite a tricky one, tricky one to source, but Robert Thompson came through with a fantastic image for us. The next thing we had to do was to raise some funds for the Moth Atlas because what we wanted to, we wanted to be able to sell the book at a subsidised um, a subsidised price and you can get this for like four hundred and ninety two odd pages hardcover book for thirty eight pound fifty and fortunately the reason for that is because we raised a good amount of money in a moth auction it's the first time that Butterfly Conservation tried anything like this for fundraising and um, it was eBay type style thing six different auctions auction lots, um, one auction lot per month. So moth recorders or people interested could choose, bid on their favourite species and have a personalised dedication on the, on the species page in the book. Um, it was really interesting. There were some, some species, again, um, highly sought after. You'd think things like elephant hawk moth or death's head hawk moth would be the ones that people went for, um, but the nutmeg was had 26 bids for it. Um, as did the small phoenix. And uh, so, yeah, really surprising what people really wanted to go for and, and, and sponsor and, and in the Atlas. Um, all of the species in the Atlas got sponsored um, and altogether there were 400 people that sponsored the moths in the, in the Atlas. And one chap, he sponsored about 100, 100 odd moths. So uh, thank you ever so much to, to him for doing that. We also, um, had business partners and business friends that sponsored sponsored moths um, or sponsored the actual atlas itself they didn't actually have a species dedication but they sponsored the whole development of the book so massive thanks to anglian lepidoptera supplies green wings holidays nature's way foods nature trek habitat aid and we also had donations from bedfordshire and northamptonshire branch of butterfly conservation the cecil pilkington charitable trust the gatliff trust the robert kiln charitable trust and the wild heart trust and it's thanks to them that we could produce this book that's affordable for the majority of people and here's a december moth they're just starting to come on the wing now and if you're running a trap you're highly likely to find one really lovely Sort of seasonal moths, December moth, Christmas is coming. So where did the data come from that's in the Moth Atlas, all those 25.6 million moth records? Well, they came from the National Moth Recording Scheme, which is run by Butterfly Conservation, and this covers the UK, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. And in each um, in each county or vice county across the land we've got a network of county moth recorders who are basically the backbone of the national moth recording scheme they're responsible for collating all the local records and um, checking and verifying the accuracy of those and then they submit those up to us at the national moth recording scheme the northern ireland is covered by the by the national moth recording scheme but the republic of ireland it isn't um, so we collaborated with um, Moths Ireland, who are basically the equivalent to the, of the National Moth Recording Scheme, but they cover the our whole island of Ireland. So we had loads of data to check, 25.6 million moth records. And what we wanted to do, although the verification checks and everything have been carried out by county moth recorders we did another layer of verification and checking of, of dots on maps and such like so here we have a provisional um, a, a provisional map of the green carpet and we have three date classes on the map so yellow dots are for records pre-1970 
Blue dots cover the period of 1970 to 1970, 1999, and the little black dots are for 2000 onwards. So we had about 867 of these maps um, and we divvied them up and sent them out to um, a series, uh, a, a, a panel of regional experts and, uh, and BC staff for scrutiny to check for what we nicknamed uh, dodgy dots. So yes, a panel of regional experts and BC staff scrutinized all these maps. And what they found, or what we found, was there are about 10,000 possible dubious records for 482 species. And these were referred back to the County Moth Recorder Network and we got a 50% response rate. Four and a half thousand of these records were retained and the county recorder um, either said, no, it's absolutely fine. Um, I've seen a specimen or a photograph or I was with the recorder. I can vouch for the record. So that was all good. And then we had 3000 records where we didn't get any response at all. So we took a pragmatic approach on those. And we had two and a half thousand records rejected by county moth recorders that they were all crikey on second look actually no, that is dodgy all that slipped through, which is, you know, totally understandable when you're dealing with oodles and oodles of data. And we also chased up missing records for at least 80 species. We also produced um, provisional flight charts um, for all of the species in the moth atlas. And this highlighted another set of issues. This is another level of verification. So here we have the lime hawk moth. This is the phenology chart or the flight chart. <clears throat> and on the Y axis, you can see the proportion of all records and the X axis are the months of the year. The historical data, which goes from 1970 to 1979 are the purple bars and the more recent records from 2000 to 2016 are the black bars. And what you can see here, um, you overlay the two together, and what you can see here is this, what on earth are these? Uh, lime hawk moths in January, February, and very and late March, and, and, then, and then these ones late September, early October. So again, these needed further investigation, and again, were referred back to the county moth recorders um, you know, for investigation and clarification and acceptance or rejection. So this little exercise, um, about 12,000 records for 587 species were thought to be possibly dubious in terms of the flight period. Um, about 4,000 of these records were due to um, Excel date formatting issues. For whatever reason, Excel sometimes decides to give a date a year of 1905, which is a serial number as opposed to an actual date. So you could tell that the record was a that, 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 that it was a result of this serial number error for, the, for some of these records, because you could have an eminent moth recorder who is still alive now, but apparently he or she recorded moths in 1905. And, um, and obviously, you know, that would make them well over 100 years old. So, um, so we could highlight those, identify those relatively easily. And then there was the whole issue of um, American date formats as well to contend with. So some of these errors are due to due to software. And as the government found out recently when they were trying to use Excel um, with their with their figures, um, it can easily uh, go a little bit awry. We also discovered that some of these errors were down to what we call a life stage and sampling method mismatch. And, oh, and there were 6000 um, 6,000 records affected by this particular issue and over half of them had had adult stage as bred X. So for example, a December moth was seen on the 23rd of May 2014. There were 30 adults apparently. Oh, but the sample to, oh, bred X pupae. So these were bred, <clears throat> which is why their flight period was, was out, of, out of kilter. And in actual fact, what this record, the best way of presenting this record would have been OBS abundance, 30 count of caterpillar, say, or however many. Um, and then the date would have been the um, 18th of the 4th, 2014. <clears throat> or it could have been an egg, an egg, you know, there could have been egg records. But having this count of adult in there, you know, it was it was not recorded quite correctly. 
And then we've got this other one here, Welsh Clearwing on the 8th of September 2002, one count of adult. Oh, but actually it's a cocoon. So again, um, it, it, um, not, not the details weren't recorded quite correctly. But anyway, we got all of that sorted out. And to put this in perspective, you know, these possible errors on perspective, in perspective. So we had 12,000 records out of 25 million, um, which were, had potentially dodgy dates. So that's 0.05% of records. Then we had the 10,000 um, 10, dodgy dots that were queried out of 25 million records. Again, that's 0.04% error rate. And if you add these up, um, it comes to 0.09%, and that's only 0.01% more errors than pesky species of clothes moths. This is my favourite statistic that I quote at, uh, in, into the media in the summertime when rent kill produce a, uh, a press release banging on about how, how rampant clothes moths are. There's only two species of, of moth, clothes moth that can be, be really problematic. So that's a, a figure of 0.08%. So really, in terms of error rates, very, very uh, minimal, but important nonetheless. We couldn't produce uh, an atlas with lots of errors in it, and particularly with the flight charts. They'd look ridiculous. And here we have a lovely emerald moth. So once all the issues had been ironed out and we had a clean data set, um, we used those to produce the final distribution maps and the final uh, flight charts, phenology charts for the Atlas. So this collaboration between Butterfly Conservation's National Moth Recording Scheme and Moths Ireland has produced this magnificent book, which covers 893 macro moth species, 867 of which have uh, species with accounts in it and we've also got 26 um, species in the appendices. Now these 26 species are either former residents or, and, or spe and, and they were recorded prior to the 1st of January 1970. Then we've also got um, a, a second appendix in the book um, which includes the aggregates. So these are species which are difficult to separate um, visually unless you identify, unless you inspect their genitalia and that way then they can be separated. Um, but a lot of recorders don't separate um, common rustic and, and, and lesser common rustic. So they record them as an aggregate. So there's aggregate maps in there as well in the, in the second appendix, appendice. So, <clears throat> This gives you, uh, shows you um, a layout of a, a species account. There's two per page. And this one here is for the elephant hawk moth. So we've got a cracking image here um, by Ian Leach of the elephant hawk moth. This is actually my favorite moth because it's pink and green. Um, and then we've got the, the common name, the scientific name. And again, we've got the, um, <clears throat> the different colored dots depending on the, the date of the record or the year of the record. And we've got that for Britain, including the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. And this, these figures here give you the number of 10K squares that the moth was, that species was recorded in during that date class, that time period. And again, we've got the, the same for Ireland here as well. We also um, produce distribution trends. And underneath the photograph, you have the GB long-term distribution trend, so 1970 to 2016, in the case of the elephant hawk moth, and this moth has significantly increased its distribution by 147% over this, uh, uh, from between those years. And um, then we've got the short-term abundant distribution trend from 2000 to 2016, that's 9%. It's not significant for this particular species. The significant trends have a little asterisk next to them and they're in bold. And then we've got the abundance trends as well from the Rothamsted Insect Survey Light Trap Network. And we also, we've also got um, red list, red list, the GB red list status and the Irish red list status in there. Then we needed a little bit of blurb to explain um, what was on the page. And we decided that what we wanted to do was um, this text needed to be 
needed to help the interpretation of the novel information on the page. So, for example, the, the, the distribution map uh, and, the, uh, and, and the, flight, the flight chart and, and the trends as well. We didn't want to have, um, a, we basically, we didn't want to have a regurgitation of what's already out there in the fabulous field guides. And so we, and also because space was at a premium, we only wanted one volume of the Moth Atlas, not two. Um, so it had to be really concise text. And it was quite a challenge to ensure that the text was uh, about 336 characters, including spaces. So to make the text um, meaningful and readable, um, it was really was quite a challenge. So as I said, so there's the there's the blurb about the, the particular species and, and interpretation of the information. We've got a flight chart um, on each page as well for each species. Um, and we've got the Channel Islands there just tucked in. And perhaps last but definitely not least, in the bottom right hand side of each page, we've got the sponsorship information. So this elephant hawk moth was sponsored by Gary, Deborah, Jennifer and Rebecca Jones. And there's been some really, really lovely tributes to, you know, to um, to mentors and pets and all kinds of things in there. And it just gives a real personal touch to the moth atlas. So what does the atlas show us? Well, it shows us that recording intensity over time has absolutely uh, gone crazy and, 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 and increased massively. So here we've got the number of records on the y-axis and then on the x-axis we've got the years and you can see from about 2000 onwards you know the number of records that have been submitted and that the county moth recorders have to deal with has, has gone you know has, has really really rapidly increased over the years and so there's 25.6 million moth records in there recovering a time period of 275 years and when you think about um, coverage at 10 kilometers square resolution um, we've got 97 percent coverage of of the uk of well, britain and ireland um, at 10 kilometers square resolution and this little chart here just shows the percentage of records on the y-axis and then the three different time date classes on the x-axis and again, what you can see here is that 3% of records are historical, 24% um, were gathered between 1970 and 1999, or the records are from that time period. And in recent years, from 2000 to 2016, 73% of moth records in the Atlas are, are recent records. So you can see that county moth recorders are, have got a real job on their hands with this massive increase in uh, in records that they receive because moth recording is so so popular and it's you know and it's really quite easy to to get involved with so um and then down here on the right you've got these two guys here and uh and you can see that they you know that who would have thought that the, these two would have been trailblazers i'm quite sure that their records are in the moth atlas and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the attire has moved on um, considerably since since back since back then, and as has the technology um, in terms of like the moth traps that people were using. So, um, and obviously nowadays as well, there's lots and lots of developments in 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 data handling, data flow, and, and technology, which we really need to embrace in order to keep up with this huge huge increase in in moth recording and the popularity of moth recording. So focusing on records on the records from the recent time period, so from 2000 to 2016, this map here shows recording intensity at 10 kilometer square resolution. So what I haven't said before is each one of these dots is a, is a 10 kilometer square. And the darker the color, the more records there are per 10k square. And you can see that sort of Southern England, as you move further northwards, the, the sort of record intensity does tend to drop off, but that's because there are fewer species. And also there's also um, a lot of more remote areas um, to, to get to, to reach, and the same goes for Ireland. And also there's fewer moth recorders as well. So there's fewer moth recorders to cover great swathes of, of, of land and, and land mass. 
So there's 18.7 million records in, for the more recent period in the Atlas. And SV91 on the Isles of Scilly is the, um, is the most well recorded 10 kilometer square in, uh, in, in uh, the UK with 184,907 records. And, uh, and T29 in County Wicklow um, has got 44,910 records um, for, for Ireland. That's the most well covered square in Ireland and I do believe it's round about there and that's also where the uh, County Moth Recorder lives as well or the old County Moth Recorder lived as well. So looking at species density at 10 kilometer square resolution so this is a number of species per 10k square for the more recent period 2000 to 2016 um, 893 species altogether, 761 of these are considered to be resident somewhere in the British Isles. And in terms of the most species rich square, uh, um, it's uh, TRO2 in Kent with 548 species. I do believe that's down here somewhere. Hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, and, and again, T29 in County Wicklow with 369 species. And again, what I haven't said again is that the colour, the colour scheme again, the darker the colour, the higher the density of, uh, of, of, of species per 10k square. And again, that peters out as you spread further northwards. <coughs> Excuse me. So. We wanted to use the National Moth Recording Scheme data and the Moths Island data to produce um, occupancy models. And the data collected in, for the NMRS and for Moths Island, um, it's not, there's no standardized methodology. And it's basically any moth, anytime, anywhere. So it's a bit of a Chinzano scheme. Um, and therefore temporal and spatial bias in the data can occur, but occupancy modeling which is a relatively new statistical approach, can cope with these, um, these inherent biases in the data. And it takes account of these when you're producing trends. So we managed to produce robust, robust distribution trends for Great Britain at one kilometre square. Now, we couldn't include um, the Moths Island data because unfortunately at, at this point in time, there's not enough of it to produce reliable trends, but it won't be long until we can, um, particularly with the, you know, the, 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 the boost and the, the interest and the growth in, in moth recording. So watch this space for Irish trends. Um, we managed to produce um, long-term trends for 511 species. So those either range from 1970 to 2016 or 1980 to 2016 or 1990 to 2016. And we also produced 559 trend, uh, species, trends for 559 species and aggregates for the short term, so i.e. 2000 to 2016. And what did this show us? Well, so, well, before I go on to that, we took the standardized long-term trends for the longest time period there was available. So that was from 1970 to 2016. It's a 47 year period. And we found that 390 species had sufficient data um, for this, um, for, to produce trends for, from 1970 to 2016. And what we found is that 42% of species had declined in distribution over this time period, and 58% of species had actually increased in distribution over this time period. The biggest loser in terms of distribution was the white colon, um, a reduction in distribution of 94% over the 47 year period. But the biggest winner was the red green carpet with an increase of 667% um, percent increase in its distribution over the same time period. So this chart here, this shows, so this, this shows these 390 species that we managed to generate long-term trends for um, plotted in a, in a chart here. We've got the number of species on the y-axis and the distribution trend on the x-axis and zero means there's no change. Red, ready pinky bars are, are, um, are, are the, 
species that have su suffered si significant declines. They're in the darker pink there, and that's 31% of species. And then we've got the species that had inc had significant increases, which are the dark blue bars here. That was that 38% uh, of species had showed significant increases, and 36 of these had more than doubled. So that would be these these here. And of the ones that declined, 46 species declined by at least 50%. And we had 31% of species that showed no significant change at all. And so that's these, these paler bits of the, the chart, the pale blue bits and the pale pink bits. So just to look at a species that's done well and has expanded its distribution, um, in, in, in recent years. So this is the Jersey tiger. This moth has been spotted all over the shop this year. Um, there, we had so many inquiries about, you know, what, what's this butterfly? And actually, well, it's actually, it's a day flying moth. Uh, it's the Jersey tiger. Um, it's increased its uh, distribution by 861% from 1990 to 2016. Um, it used to be confined to um, the Southwest and Devon. Um, but it's spread out, um, spread out towards Hampshire and, uh, and northwards up towards Wales. And, um, and there's also a, a good, it's spreading rapidly as well in the, in the London area. And, um, and it's going to be really interesting when we get the 2020 data in to see how far, you know, how far has this, this moth, you know, spread. One that's not done so well, um, unfortunately, which is one of my, again, another, well, yeah, elephant, hawk, moth and lappet, that I think they're my two favourite moths, actually. <laughs> Who can have a favourite? I've got two. Um, so you've got the, the lappet there, um, real beautiful little moth, looks like a shrew, um, to me anyway. Um, and the distribution trend for this moth is a decline of 61% from 1980 to 2016. And again, we've got our dots up here, yellow, pre-1970, blue dots 1970 to 1999 and the black dots for 2000 onwards and you can see that there are so many places so many 10 kilometer squares that are yellow or blue without any recent records on them and this is really quite shocking and, it, and I find this 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 map a little bit depressing really um, to see that this such a fabulous moth is declining so so rapidly um, and we don't really understand why um, many of our moths, we don't really understand why they're increasing or, or, or decreasing and, and the Moth Atlas provides a treasure trove of data for us to mine further to find out more about what's happening. Um, it could be unsympathetic hedgerow management um, that's affecting th this moth um, as well as other sorts of, you know, other habitat, habitat loss factors and, and various other things which I'll talk more about later on. Um, but yeah, quite, quite a depressing quite a depressing a little map there. So, so we've managed to generate our distribution trends. And then what we wanted to do was produce abundance trends. Now, the abundance data came from the Rothamsted Insect Survey uh, light trap network. There's around about 100 traps that run across the UK every night, and they have done for quite some time. And so this is standardized trapping methodology. And so it's it's much easier to deal with standardized data. So um, robust abundance trends were generated for Great Britain. Again, there aren't enough Rothamsted traps on the island of Ireland to produce uh, abundance trends at this point in time. And, uh, and a, a technique called the generalized abundance index was used. Don't worry, I'm not gonna show you any horrible, um, scary, equations or anything like that. So, um, but we managed to generate 400 uh, trends for 427 macro moth species. And we worked with scientists from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and, and Rothamsted Research to produce these, these trends. And again, what did we find? Well, what we did is we took the standardised, the, the, you know, the standard, the longest period of time, well, we took the abundance trends from 1970 to 2016, um, 397 species had robust trends and what we found is that 62% of species have declined in abundance um, since 1970 
percent of species had increased in abundance since 1970. The biggest loser um, was the stout dart, um, a decline of 100%. Uh, we do believe that this moth may well now be extinct in, in Britain, um, with the last known record being um, in Norfolk from 2007. So this one's, you know, gone extinct right under our noses. Um, the biggest winner is the buff footman with an absolutely astonishing 84,589% increase in abundance over this 47 year period. So um, this moth is a, is a like is a lichen feeder and um, we do believe that um, the Clean Air Act of the 1950s cleaned up our air, is allowed, um, is, is, a, is reduced air pollution, it's allowed lichens to flourish um, which has then enabled the, the, some of the footman species of moths to flourish because the, the food plants abundant and, and they're away. So when we look at the abundance trends again, um, on another one of these lovely charts, um, we can see that 34% of species suffered significant abundance declines and 108 of those declined by at least, at least 50%. So again, the pink bars, the dark pink bars are um, significant declines and the pale pink ones are just declines without any statistical significance. And again, the blue bars, the blue bars, um, the significant ones are dark blue bars and 45 species, so that's 11%, um, showed significant increases and 35 species more than doubled. And again, we've got these pale pink, the pale pink and pale blue are non-significant uh, trends. Then we looked at, um, we compared, we compared distribution trends and abundance trends. And on the, and we could do this for 351 species that had long-term distribution and abundance trends from 1970 to 2016. <clears throat> and what you can see here is on the y-axis, we've got the distribution, the log of the distribution trend. And on the x-axis, we've got the um, log of the abundance trend. So what we found is that 94 species had gone up in both measures, so both abundance and distribution, and 121 species had declined in both abundance and distribution. But the thing here is to look at is the significance of the species trend. So if they're significant in both measures, they get a little red dot. Um, if they're significant in abundance only, a little blue triangle, a pink triangle for distribution only. And if they're not significant uh, trends, then they're, they're little gray squares. And most of the little gray squares are sort of in the middle there. We also looked at um, changes in flight period, flight flight periods and phenology um, for the moths in, in the atlas. We did this for 405 single brooded species. We excluded winter flying moths because they span two calendar years and that makes the uh, calculations really, really tricky at this point in time. I'm sure statistical, statistical developments will enable this um, further down the line. Um, but what we did is we took the mean flight dates for 405 um, single brooded species and, uh, and looked at look and compared the flight period from 1979, uh, 1970 to 1979 with the 2000 to 2016 data. And we did this for Britain, Ireland and the Isle of Man. We excluded the Channel Islands because geographically and climatically they're more similar to the continent than, than to um, uh, mainland UK and Britain. And what we found is that on average mean flight dates were 4.8 days earlier for the recent time period, so 2000 to 2016, compared to the historical data. And this chart here on the y-axis you've got number of species here and difference in days on the x-axis and uh, basically 
this means uh, no change. Um, so you can see that these species here are flying uh, later and these are flying earlier than they were in the past. What we found altogether is that 81% of species are flying earlier and to at least and 12 of those at least two weeks or 14 days earlier. For example, the grey birch, um, here's the flight chart for this species. Again, proportion of all records on the y-axis, uh, months of the year on the x-axis, and again, uh, little purple bars for the historical data and little black bars for the more recent data. And you can see here that the moth is emerging earlier um, and fly and peaking earlier uh, and, and tailing off earlier than it than it did um, historically. And we've also got 19% of species that are flying later. For example, this pink barred sallow and 13 of these are, are, are flying at least seven days later, um, probably due to warmer autumns um, nowadays. So again, we've got the, you know, the proportion of all records against months of the year. And again, the pale purple is the, uh, is, is the historical data and the black bars are the more recent records. Oh, here we are again, elephant hawk moth, lovely. Elephant hawk moth sat on uh, honeysuckle, beautiful. I hope you're all with me still. It's really difficult sitting here and staring at a screen, uh, not knowing if anyone's out there. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? I guess you are and you'll tell me at the end. So uh, anyway, so we found all this fantastic information, um, some of it uh, a little bit depressing um, about the Britain and Ireland's moths. And what we want to know, you know, what, what is driving, what is driving these, these changes um, in, in moth populations and distributions? Well, there's a potent cocktail driving biodiversity change. Um, although studies for moths are few and far between, it's highly likely that the changes that are, are, are the, the, the core, the drivers of all these other biodi biodiversity, uh, the drivers of a lot of the biodiversity crisis are likely to be the same um, for moths. So I guess the first major thing is land use change. We've lost, I think, 97% of our flower rich meadows um, since the Dig for Victory campaign after the war. Um, and these lovely meadows, but full of nectar sources and larval food plants and, and you know, homes for all these beautiful, lovely species, have just been destroyed to make way for agricultural, um, agricultural monocultures as a result of agricultural intensification, and also housing developments for, you know, the growing human population. And, um, and and also, you know, lifestyle 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 decisions to have like second homes. But some land use changes are beneficial to species. So, for example, we've got the spruce carpet that has done really well and has increased its distribution by 557% and its abundance by 3,363% since the 19, uh, since the 1970s. And, um, and it's really benefited from the planting of what I call carnivorous plantation, because the only things that really can live in a conifer plantation are things that want to eat you and suck your blood like midges and horseflies. Um, but anyway, spruce carpets, you know, really, really benefited and run really well from, from this afforestation. And we can see that by, from looking at its distribution map, um, again, yellow dots pre-1970, blue dots 70 to 1999, and the black dots 2000 onwards. And you can just see that where it's just, you know, it, it's, it's expanding its range and it's spreading out northwards, um, up in, you know, all the way up in, in the north and then into Scotland and the, uh, the, 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 the central belt and, and all around, uh, all around Inverness Way and everywhere and even up there at uh, John O'Groats. And again, similar picture in Ireland, you know, it's just spreading, spreading rapidly. So that one's, you know, done pretty well out of, you know, as a result of human, uh, human intervention. Um, yeah. 
And then we've got something like the Blair shoulder knot. Well, this, this moth was first recorded in 1951 on the Isle of Wight and uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Britain and in 2002 in Ireland. And again, this is done really well by, from the planting of non-native cypresses like Leylandii. And uh, it's experienced a 206% increase in distribution and a 321% increase in abundance. Um, and again, here you can see the, uh, the, the distribution map for this species. Not quite as dramatic as the, uh, as the spruce carpet, uh, but again, you can see it's you know, spreading into Wales, it's spreading out across, uh, spreading out across uh, Ireland, and then in, in the north of England and uh, up into the uh, sort of central belt of, of Scotland. But the latest craze um, for garden in gardens um, seems to me to be um, artificial grass. Now, artificial grass is completely, it might, may look nice, but it's absolutely sterile. And, um, and, I, and there's no nothing, you know, what, what can live in plastic grass? And there's been um, a massive increase in, in artificial grass being laid over the last year. And apparently sales during lockdown went absolutely crazy as well with everybody uh, being furloughed and doing garden renovation projects and 800 hectares of, of uh, artificial grass have been laid between 2019 and 2020. So, um, and, the, and it's so prolific these days that there's even YouTube videos um, telling you how to clean up after your dog um, and get rid of like nasty niffs from your artificial grass and also how to clear up tomato sauce spillages after a barbecue. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, we thought that decking and graveling was bad, but this, oh, I don't know. And I would imagine as well that in the summer when it's hot, that this grass is so hot, you, you know, your pets might burn their feet, your kids might burn their, burn their hands and their feet on it. And, you know, any self-respecting insect that lands on it as well is, is probably going to be in for a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a hot experience. So it's not just, um, it's not just our gardens and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and urban areas that are under pressure. Um, there's changing management and land use in the countryside. And, you know, countryside management has changed due to the intensification of agriculture. Um, hedgerow trees like this one have been shown to be um, refugia for moths in, in, in agricultural landscapes. Um, field margins are also really beneficial for them and we've also and there's also been research done to show that less intensively managed hedges are also um, you know more species rich uh, in moths than than these that are sort of you know had a short back and sides and a bit of a crew cut so and sympathetic hedgerow management and landscape management can actually be achieved by um, agri-environment uh, scheme prescriptions. Changing management in the countryside as well doesn't just relate to mechanical um, issues. It's also, um, down, you know, there's also livestock, livestock uh, density, stocking densities of livestock to consider as well. So we all know if we've been out into sheep grazed pasture that there's next to nothing there. It's the grass is nibbled to within, within a, you know, a millimeter of its life. And, uh, and it's, you know, and it's pretty sterile and barren. Um, whereas low intensity grazing has been shown to support far more moths than high intensity grazing. And then we've got nitrogen pollution. Well, nitrogen pollution is not just, um, it, it's, a, it's an urban and a rural issue. Um, because nitrogen deposition from exhaust fumes and also, um, you know, and also the, the spreading of nitrogen fertilizer in the, in the countryside is a problem. And research recently has shown that there's been increased mortality in, la in the larvae of some species, for example, the small, small dot, a uh, straw dot, sorry, and the blood vein moth. Um, what they did is they set up an experiment and when fertilizer was applied to host plants at the rates typically used in agriculture, they saw increased mortality in these in the larvae of these species. Um, and also active nitrogen in soils can uh, 
increases in active nitrogen in soils can change the soil chemistry and structure and composition of plant communities. And then that again has knock on effects to, to moths. Um, light pollution is also a factor for moths. Um, an artificial light at night is a knock on effect of, of urbanization. To this day, we don't really understand why moths fly to light, um, but what we have discovered um, is that um, in recent years is that uh, light pollution can affect the pheromone production in female cabbage, cabbage moths. So if they're not producing, you know, if they're not producing the right pheromone mixture, then they're not going to attract the males and they can't breed and that has knock on effects. Um, there's also um, larval growth. Um, there's reduced larval growth in, in, the, in the rustic shoulder knot. And also light pollution can in inhibit feeding in, uh, adult, in some species of moths, um, adult moths, for example, the common marbled carpet. And there's also reduction in, in, uh, in, in nocturnal pollination. I always, the way I see moths is, you know, bees get, a lo bees get loads and loads of press and publicity because they're really, really important pollinators of plants. But to my mind, moths are the bees of the nighttime, if you like, because they're busy pollinating under the cover of darkness. So there's that. And, and let's not also forget that when moths are busy flying around, you know, blinded by the light, got disco fever around the street lights or what else security lighting or whatever then they're not going out and breeding and feeding and doing the th and pollinating and doing the things that they need to do to sustain their their populations and they're also at risk from being burnt and and uh, burnt alive and burnt and get yeah yeah burnt to a crisp on hot lamps and um uh, and also uh they are at risk, at higher risk of predation from, from bats and such like. So light pollution is not good either. Climate change is another biggie, and we're all well aware of the impact of climate change, um, you know, on, on a wider scale in terms of forest fires, you know, wildfires springing up here, there and everywhere, sea level rise, blah de blah um, but what we're also finding is that it's affecting the species, affecting species range, range margins. So range margins of southern moths are expanding northwards at an accelerating rate. There's been some work done that looked at um, the, the, range, the range margins of, of moths during 1966 to 1975 and then 1986 to 1995. And during these two time periods, there was an 11 kilometre sort of shift northwards. Um, but let's fast forward for, to 1986 to 1995 compared to the early 2000s. And this rate of, accel this rate of spread has is, is accelerated up to 31 kilometers per decade. Um, a couple of species that have benefited from this are, of, you know, climate change is the black arches, which has increased its distribution in Great Britain by 307% from 1970 to 2016. And also the red-necked footman, very appropriately named there with his little red neck, um, a 66% increase in this species distribution from 1990 to 2016. Um, there's a, a climate risk assessment that was, was, was done relatively recently. Um, and what that shows is that um, it's not all it's it's not all bad news for species um, because more than sixty percent of the four hundred and twenty two moth species they studied could increase in their overall extent by 2099. Um, but there are lags due to habitat availability. A moth can't spread northwards if there's no habitat for it to to move to, or if it's isolated and you know suffering from uh, you know as, as a result of habitat fragmentation. So there are these these lags there. And as I sort of alluded to earlier. Um, climate change is also changing the phenology of species. So here we've got the, the flame shoulder moth. Um, the abundance um, has increased, its abundance has increased by 65% from 1970 to 2016. And again, you've got the flight chart here. And what you can see is the historical records in the sort of pale, pale purple there. 
um, and you can see this moth is becoming more recently more strongly brooded um, more yeah more more strongly double brooded and this this second brood is appearing earlier so uh, so loads of information in there and to, to be picked apart and and ex and, and, and uh, what's the word explored further so there's been a lot of talk in the media um, over recent years about insect Armageddon. Um, and so, you know, we're quite often asked, um, does the moth, do the moth atlas results show the same, uh, the same, the same thing? And are we heading towards moth Armageddon? Well, the answer in short is no, because many species are colonizing um, the UK naturally um, from, for coming across from Europe. And, and then there's also accidental introductions as well through the horticultural trade and such like. So, um, but again, some of those introductions are having, you know, having negative effects as well. Um, yeah, so, uh, but that's not, just because we're not heading to Mothmageddon, it doesn't mean to say that we can take our foot off the gas um, we still really, really need to help our butterfly and well, butterflies and moth species and conserve them as, as best we can for, for future generations. I mean, wouldn't it be a shame if in future all we see is pinned specimens in a in in, in museum museum drawers or, uh, or 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 just pictures, photographs? In in fact, you know, all these used to be flying around. Um, but anyway, so. In terms of human impact on the environment, we've known for a long, long time that we are having negative effects on, on, on the environment. So we've got Joni Mitchell with a big yellow taxi song, Marvin Gaye, Mercy, Mercy Me, The Ecology. Um, and then there was Richard Adams' book, um, Watership Down, and then the film as well in 1978. And of course, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which came out in uh, 1962. So. I do realise I'm in a bit of a time warp back then, but um, you know these these things have been on the on our horizon, on the agenda for a long time, and for whatever reason, governments maybe now they will, but they're just not really getting the message that. And it's more important than ever now with this global pandemic that we recognise how important nature and the environment is to us. We need it. You know, we rely on it. Um, and so the, the sort of the champions at the, the moment, if you like, in the in the real sort of uh, in the in the modern world, we've got um, old Greta there in a superwoman outfit. Um, you know, she's really bringing the the state of the planet to uh, you know to the fore. And also David Attenborough's A Life on Our Planet um, that was shown relatively recently. And things must be bad. For David Attenborough to actually venture into the world of social media as well. So, um, I mean, fortunately, we've got these two champions, plus all these other thousands of amazing people out there recording moths and butterflies and doing their bit. And I'm well aware that, um, <coughs> excuse me, that it can be quite depressing, you know, that what's happening with the world and nature and all the rest of it. But and what we need to do is we need to feel empowered to you know to make a difference and to make a change and and butterfly conservation has got a uh, a campaign called be the butterfly effect uh, and the whole thing meaning that if you throw a, a, a when a butterfly flaps its wings it will have knock-on effects wider and again the same as if you throw a pebble on a pond the ripples ripple out so the butterfly effect um gives people can give you a uh, it gives you an idea of all the different things that you can do to feel empowered and have agency to really make a change in a world that does seem quite miserable and depressing. And as a great man, uh, Krishnamurti said, to change the world, we must begin with ourselves. And I, and I think that's absolutely vital. So it's about thinking about the wider ramifications of the everyday decisions that we all make as well. And, you know, recognising what those knock on effects might be. Um, so it's worth having a look um, if you're feeling a little bit bewildered and think, oh, crikey Moses, what on earth can I do to make things better? Have a look at that. So, I mean, the other thing as well, and if you don't believe me about the, the whole butterfly effect and the fact that everyone can make a difference and everyone's got something to contribute, well, 
it's here. It's it's right here, right in front of us. Here we have all these different groups of moth recorders. We've got these two guys from, you know, back in bygone days. We've got a bunch of moth recorders in Scotland. We've got these guys here and then we've got these guys here and girls. And what are they doing? All of their individual little dots have contributed to the Moth Atlas. And not one of them probably thought that that was going to be the knock on effect of them collecting those moths or recording those moths on that particular night. So it, you know, it does happen and it can happen, this whole butterfly effect. Um, and yeah, so here we are. Uh, that just goes to show that you know our actions do have knock-on effects so perhaps rather than call it the butterfly effect in this this particular example maybe it's the moth effect the other thing we can keep doing is keep recording keep recording butterflies and moths um, that every single dot on a map is our or every record is it provides our evidence base our scientific evidence base and all this feeds in all these moth records feed into our conservation work be it single species conservation um, or, or landscape scale conservation like what we've got going on in, in, the, in the Brex for several species of moths and we can also give advice to landowners so this is the um, Weymouth Relief Road um, down in Dorset and um, and we've worked we worked well Phil Sterling worked with uh, the, the highways agency um, to restore this not put any topsoil back down just let it naturally regenerate put a few uh, some some uh, seeds down and see what happens and now this is you know a wash with butterflies and moths during during the summer months and we're rolling out rolling this out nationally um, Phil's working with with lots of uh, local government agencies and building sites and, and all sorts of all sorts of development people to make them take butterflies and moths into uh, you know having butterflies and moths in mind when they're doing the work that they're doing even if it's cutting you know even if it's verge cutting and obviously as well then we you know provide advice to landowners be that um, little little farmers or you know big estates or, or whatever so these records underpin all your moth and butterfly records underpin all of our conservation work you can't conserve something unless you know where it is so these records are absolutely vital and obviously all these records again they all feed into uh to help inform research as well and also our all our advocacy like reports and, and such like the state of britain's larger moths the state of butterflies um, and all the rest of it so again really really vital information that you guys are collecting to enable conservation to, and, and research to happen and also to lobby and, and lobby governments and, and design and, and, and influence policy so we're almost there so just a quick summary of the atlas um, moth recording is a popular pastime and it's getting more and more and more popular. And so we, Butterfly Conservation, we really need to support the County Moth Recorder Network to enable them to be sustainable moving forwards. Um, you know, I don't envy County Moth Recorders at all with the amount of records that they've got to deal with and the tools available to them. So we really need to support them to, you know, help sustain this movement moving forwards. The Atlas provides a timely account for our moths. And as I said, it's a treasure trove to be mined. I mean, I don't know, what on earth people are going to find out from if they mine the data and all the rest of it but I think it's going to be quite phenomenal and also like I said you know carry on recording keep going out there keep recording moths butterflies and any other nature that you want and submit your records and let's really you know let's really try and turn this turn things around so before I finish I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the county moth recorders the moth recording community conservationists researchers funders supporters and photographers um, Moths Ireland, my co-authors, my colleagues, um, Nature Bureau, who actually did all the design work for the Moth Atlas, um, endless amounts of patience with us, I'm sure, um, and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and Rothamsted Insect Survey, who we collaborated with. And so thank you to you for listening. Um, and I don't know if you've got any questions, but if you've got a question, your first question might be, where can I get a Moth Atlas? and you can get one here. Thank you.
That was great. Thank you very much. We have had a couple of questions come in. We are out of time, but we'll take a couple um, if that's OK. So the first one that came in is what is a good moth trap to use when you're in a city and there's a lot of light pollution already? Right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's you, obviously as well. You don't really want to use be using too bright a lights either because um, you'll be upsetting your neighbours, I expect. Um, the trap that I've used um, pretty regularly is um, it's the NHBS Natural History Bookstores moth trap. It's collapsible. It's got a black light, so it doesn't glow too much. It won't upset your neighbours. Um, it's black light, but it's got really good uh, catch retention. And I've had um, had um, you know had had good results with it as well so okay and Stephen Green has asked do the county recorders also check records submitted to the iRecord app that's a good one fantastic very timely as well um some county recorders are engaging with iRecord and verifying the records within iRecord and some aren't um we are we're encouraging the use of iRecord because um, it's a great tool for, for, for county recorders to use and it does enable them to have access to a whole new suite of recorders. But obviously, then again, that increases workload. So um, I think if you're thinking of um, so in short, some do, some don't. Um, but I think if you want your the only way that moth records get into the National Moth Recording Scheme is through the County Moth Recorder Network. So if I were you, if you're putting your records into iRecord, I would check with your County Moth Recorder if he or she is actually verifying them in there. Okay, great. And Trevor Edmondson has asked, will you keep updating these trends regularly? Yeah, I think I think we will. I think we're there's a that we're looking to update them every sort of five to ten years. Um, obviously, it depends on resources and the records coming in and, and all the rest of it. But that's that's what we aim. That's what we aim to do. We've got the um, like the, the butterfly records, uh, the butterfly recording scheme, the butterflies for new millennium. We do do sort of regular sort of five yearly updates with that. So we'll look to do similar for moths. OK, and then just one more has come in from Anonymous, going back to the very start of the presentation. What do you mean by pragmatic approach for the 3000 with no response? Were they retained or were they rejected? Well, that's exactly what I mean by a pragmatic approach. Some were and some weren't. OK, great. Thank you. For that. There's a couple more and we'll try to come back to you on email. But unfortunately, we are now out of time. So thank you to everyone who joined us this evening, whether you joined us on Zoom or Facebook. Don't forget the book is available to purchase online via the Nature Bureau and it is a limited edition print run. For those of you who joined via Zoom, we'll be sending you an email later this week with a recording of this webinar and also a link to where you can purchase the book. Thank you again for everyone who joined us and we hope to see you all again soon. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Becky.